In the depths of our vast oceans, a tale of mystery and intrigue awaits. It is a story that will challenge our understanding, ignite our curiosity, and leave us questioning the limits of human exploration. Brace yourselves for a journey that will defy expectations and unravel the enigma that lies beneath. What secrets lie hidden in the abyssal depths? What drove Ocean Gate to push the boundaries of possibility? And what cost did they pay for their audacity? Prepare to be spellbound as we plunge into the heart of this captivating tale. Follow in the footsteps of explorers who dared to go where few have ventured before. Witness the triumphs, the setbacks, and the fateful choices that would shape their destiny. What mysteries lie within the construction of the Titan? What dark forces conspired against their mission? And why did they persist, despite the warnings that echoed through the depths? Prepare to be gripped by the untold stories, the hidden truths, and the revelations that will leave you breathless. As we delve into the heart of this riveting saga, be prepared to question everything you thought you knew. Beneath the ocean's depths lies a tragic tale waiting to be uncovered. Ocean Gate, a company whose troubling disregard for critical factors raises concerns, sets sail on a momentous voyage in search of the Titan. It all began with their acquisition of Antipodes in 2012, followed by the development of Cyclops-1, in collaboration with the University of Washington's Applied Physics Laboratory. But even with Cyclops-1's maximum depth of 500 meters, they fell short of the Titan's resting place. Undeterred, Ocean Gate unveiled their ultimate creation, the Titan. With a remarkable depth rating of 4,000 meters, it stood as a testament to human engineering. Notably, the Titan boasted a carbon fiber and titanium hull, an exotic combination in the field of materials engineering. While carbon fiber is commonly used in high-end applications, its usage in deep-sea exploration remains relatively unexplored, presenting significant challenges in design and manufacturing. To obtain the carbon composite cylinder for the Titan, Ocean Gate partnered with Spencer Composites in January 2017. Interestingly, Spencer Composites was the same company responsible for building the James Cameron Deep Flight Challenger. Despite the challenges and complexities, Ocean Gate pressed on, driven by their determination to unlock the secrets of the Titan. Their quest to uncover a tragic tale hidden within the ocean's embrace was about to commence. Yet, the story took a dark turn when the Titan submersible mysteriously disappeared. This unexpected event raised even more questions and cast a shadow of doubt on its claimed engineering prowess. But what made matters worse was the devastating news that all of its crew members had tragically lost their lives. Well, yesterday, the U.S. Coast Guard revealed that all five people who'd been aboard the submersible, hoping to see the wreck of the Titanic, had died. What went so tragically wrong is now under investigation. The incident sent shockwaves to the underwater exploration community, leading to intense scrutiny of Ocean Gate's technological advancements. Fingers were pointed, and doubts were raised about the reliability and safety of the Titan. The investigation aimed to determine whether there were flaws in the design, construction, or operation of the Titan. Questions emerged. Were critical factors disregarded? Was the carbon fiber and titanium hull truly reliable under extreme conditions? Could there have been unforeseen vulnerabilities that compromised the safety of the crew? As the search for answers continued, Ocean Gate faced mounting pressure to provide explanations and address the concerns surrounding their engineering practices. Intrigued by the unfolding events surrounding the Titan sub, we sought to learn more. Our journey led us to Ocean Gate, the company at the center of this remarkable endeavor. However, upon arriving at their headquarters, we were met with a disheartening discovery. Their website had been taken down. 
The absence of their online presence left us with more questions than answers. Why did OceanGate remove their website? Was it a precautionary measure in light of the Titan's disappearance and the loss of its crew? Or did it signify a deeper turmoil within the company itself? Our attempts to reach out to OceanGate for clarification were met with silence. The once promising portal to their world of underwater exploration had vanished, leaving us with a void of information. The removal of their website raised concerns about transparency and accountability. As observers, we were left to piece together the fragments of this perplexing puzzle on our own. Our quest for understanding persisted, as we turned to other sources and individuals connected to the Titan project. Through interviews, documents, and archival footage, we aim to shed light on the enigma that shrouded Ocean Gate's actions and the fate of the Titan. Our first step is to delve into the realm of materials engineering, where the Titan's composition comes to life. The vessel's construction materials, particularly its carbon fiber hull and titanium ports, they are the main key to understanding its strengths and weaknesses. Carbon fiber, renowned for its exceptional strength to weight ratio, has found applications in various industries, from aerospace to high performance sports. However, its utilization in the demanding conditions of deep sea exploration remains relatively unexplored. To fully comprehend the integrity of the Titan's carbon fiber hull, we must understand the intricacies of its design and manufacturing. Every step, from the selection of materials to the construction process, plays a crucial role in ensuring its resilience. The core of this structure lies a 5-inch thick pressure vessel, meticulously crafted with great enthusiasm by Rush and his team. Layer by layer, carbon fiber is carefully wrapped, creating a protective cocoon. However, some experts have raised concerns, deeming this method susceptible to weakness. They suggest alternative patterns, such as diamond or crisscross, to enhance its strength. Despite its flaws, this approach remains the most pragmatic choice for Rush. To shed light on the intricacies of carbon fiber, we turn to an esteemed aerospace industry expert. This knowledgeable individual emphasizes the importance of frequent testing, a process that Stockton Rush neglected. With an investment of around 20 grand, valuable testing could have been conducted, potentially preventing the Titan's tragic fate. Let us heed the expert's words and glean wisdom from his insights. This is a, a liner that goes inside a, a turbine engine. Greg Kress is the company's co-founder, an engineer and instructor, and a big believer in composites, like those used to build commercial aircraft and used for the hull of the doomed Titan submersible. The nice thing about composites is, is they are the latest, greatest space age material, and carbon fiber leading the pack. Inside here is is the walk-in freezer. Kress says it starts with a fibrous cloth stored in a freezer. This is carbon fiber right here. Here's a roll of carbon fiber sealed in the bag. The cloth is bound with resin and superheated in a two-story tall oven, yielding material that's strong and aerodynamic. The Boeing 787 Dreamliner is all made out of carbon fiber. Like if you just scratch this or hit it or something like that. But Kress says it also requires rigorous inspection. Any kind of a scratch, a nick, or a gouge, or a hole is going to cause a stress concentration. Especially if it's going to be used under hundreds of feet of water with people inside of it. It's not what we consider rocket science to inspect it. It's non-destructive inspection using ultrasound, which is the same kind of ultrasound that they use in the medical industry to see what's going on inside your body. Kress estimates an ultrasound inspection of the Titan would have cost about $20,000. Cost effective, he says, especially if passengers are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for a ride to the bottom of the sea. Non-destructive inspection is not a rarity in the world of composites. It's what we do all the time. Kress says carbon fiber has proven its value as a space age building material. The Titan accident, he says, has proven the value of testing it rigorously. 
Now, let's turn our attention to the perspective of the Steam Sea Explorer and the owner of the well-known Deep Flight Challenger, James Cameron, who brings invaluable insight into the choice of materials for the sub hull. It's completely inappropriate for a, for a, a vessel that sees external pressure. Um, you know, uh, carbon fiber composites are used very, very successfully for internal pressure, pressure vessels, like let's say a scuba tank. And you can get two or three times multiple of what you could get out of steel or aluminum for, uh, for that type of pressure bottle. But for something that's seeing external pressure, all of the advantages of composite materials go away and all the disadvantages come into play. So if you're using a uniform material like steel or uh, titanium or ceramic or acrylic, um, you can do computer modeling with a high degree of, of accuracy and confidence. The second you start doing carbon composite or, or any kind of composite materials, you're introducing two materials that are in, in contact with each other, the filament itself and then the epoxy matrix that it, that it sits within. And at that point, you have degradation failure. So it, we always understood that this was the wrong material for submersible hulls because with each pressure cycle, you can have progressive damage. So it's, it's quite insidious because you may have a number of successful dives, which is what happened here, and then have it fail later. If I were diving in a sub that, that was fully certified, I wouldn't think about it. But even in my own sub, which had a steel hull, I knew that if I, if I dove several two or three times, it was probably good to go because you can cycle steel hundreds of times, if not thousands of times. But that's not the case with composites. So it, it's quite insidious. And that, I think, lulled them into a sense of confidence and, and led to this tragedy. As you can tell from James Cameron's speech, submersibles were traditionally crafted from uniform materials like steel, titanium, ceramic, or acrylic. Yet, the Ocean Gate Titan submersible stands apart, breaking the mold with its captivating combination of cutting-edge carbon fiber and the time-tested strength of titanium in its port's construction. To delve deeper into the matter, we embarked on an experiment to test the efficiency of each element. By comparing traditional materials with the innovative carbon fiber, as we aim to uncover the strengths and weaknesses of each material, this experiment promises to unveil valuable insights and advance our understanding of submersible construction. Through comprehensive experimentation, we have uncovered compelling evidence that supports the exceptional attributes of traditional materials, particularly titanium and high-speed steel. 
It possessed notable qualities and submersible construction. These materials have demonstrated their durability, strength, and ability to withstand the challenging conditions of deep sea exploration. However, the emergence of innovative materials like carbon fiber and titanium in ocean gates tight and submersible raises intriguing questions. So why Ocean Gate neglected those traditional proven material and shifted to carbon fiber? Let's delve into the fascinating process of assembling the Titan submersible, especially a pivotal point where the carbon fiber hull meets the two titanium caps. In order to gain a deeper understanding of the submersible's construction and unravel more of its mysteries. Today is a critical a joining of the titanium and the carbon fiber. That seal needs to be uniform and small, but not too small. Level, do a good cleaning, check the surface out, and here we'll check measurements. Between the two components, um, really what's holding them together and allowing them to move together is the glue. And so you want nice, even uh, movement. It's the glue that's holding the family together, and we want to make sure it's right. Ceramic, ceramic, fiber, ceramic. Yeah. And it's pretty simple, but if we mess it up, there's not a lot of recovery. The glue is very thick, so it's not like Elmer's glue, it's like uh, peanut butter. All the things to be short cut. You figure anything over 30? That's pretty low, huh? This is the point of no return right here. I'm good already north-south, I just east to west. Oh yeah, so that will be the pressure vessel for Cyclops 2. It'll go to 4,000 meters be the deepest diving carbon fiber sub ever built. When it goes to 4,000 meters, it'll be the only one out there. I'm going to be the first guy in the sub, so we will see. The video captures the convergence of two remarkable materials, the strength and lightness of carbon fiber and the resilience of titanium. Various engineering techniques come into play during this critical stage of aligning the carbon fiber hull and the titanium rings. Adhesives specifically formulated for this purpose are applied. Surprisingly, the glue takes center stage. We witness the process of applying adhesive, a vital element in securing the components. This glue, thick and significant like peanut butter, assumes a pivotal role in the sub's construction. However, questions arise about its reliability. For the glue that binds the vessel must be flawless. Any compromise in its application could lead to dire consequences. The critics question whether glue is the most suitable binding agent for such a critical application. As the glue takes center stage, doubts are cast on its ability to withstand the extreme pressures and conditions of the deep sea. The stakes are high, and the scrutiny intensifies. Investigators and experts delve into the use of this adhesive, seeking answers to crucial questions. Was the glue chosen after careful consideration of alternative bonding methods? Were there rigorous tests conducted to verify its durability and reliability? The reliability of the glue used to secure the components becomes a focal point of the investigation into the tragedy that unfolded. Could the choice of this adhesive have played a role in the submersible's fate? As our investigation deepens, a theory emerges, drawing attention to dicyclic fatigue as a possible cause for the tragic implosion of the Titan submersible. The constant expansion and contraction of the submersible, coupled with the forces exerted during its dives, create a demanding environment for the glue and other materials used in its construction. The vulnerable point lies in the glue joint, where the adhesive bond flexes alongside other materials. 
were three points of contact susceptible to weakness. The theory suggests that these junctures could have played a pivotal role in the tragic demise of the Titan. To dive deeper into the matter, we turn our attention to Alfred Scott McLaren, a retired U.S. Navy submarine captain with a wealth of experience in deep-sea diving. Drawing upon his extensive knowledge and years of expertise operating submarines, we seek to uncover valuable wisdom and perspective that can shed light on the complexities of submersible exploration. My total time under the water, divorced from the outside atmosphere, is a little over five and three quarters years. No kidding. Fact. I mean, would you fly in an airplane that somebody excitedly tells you, well, it's going to be a lot cheaper because we found a new way of attaching the wings? Yeah, right. You have different materials, different molecular structure. They have different coefficients of expansion and compression. And you, then you make repeated cycles in depth. Of course you're going to work that seal loose. And that's why submarines don't run around with a with any portholes at all, come to think of it, it's a weak point. According to Alfred Scott McLaren, the Titan submersible's failure cannot be attributed solely to its carbon fiber hull. The use of multiple materials, including carbon fiber, titanium, and epoxy glass for the viewport, contributed significantly to its downfall. McLaren also emphasized the theory of cyclic fatigue aligning with previous discussions. This highlights the importance of material compatibility and the challenges inherent in combining diverse elements during submersible construction. Attention also turns to the viewpoint window, a prominent feature of the submersible. Its purpose is to provide a captivating view of the underwater world, but it also raises concerns as a potential weak spot in the submersible's structure. The theory posits that the immense pressures at great depths, combined with the stress placed on the window during dives, may have compromised its integrity, contributing to the submersible's catastrophic implosion. In our relentless pursuit of the truth, we stumble upon a treasure trove of hidden information. Within our possession lies a letter, dated 2018, addressed to Stockton Rush, CEO of OceanGate. Its contents reveal layer after layer of unsettling truths. As we carefully unfold the pages, the opening paragraph immediately grabs our attention. It foretells a series of negative outcomes, ranging from minor setbacks to potentially catastrophic events, all stemming from OceanGate's experimental approach. As we delve deeper, the third paragraph delivers the harshest blow. It unveils alarming concerns and recommendations, urging OceanGate to implement a prototype testing program witnessed by DND, a respected organization specializing in maritime classification and certification. The letter emphasizes the urgent need for additional time and expense to ensure the submersible safety and reliability. It paints a troubling picture shedding light on the potential risks associated with OceanGate's ambitious endeavors. The contents of this letter represent a pivotal moment in our investigation. They expose a hidden truth, suggesting that critical warnings were issued regarding the submersible's construction and testing processes. Layer after layer of hidden truths begins to unravel revealing a complex web of decisions and actions that may have contributed to the tragic fate of the Titan submersible. Our focus turns to the 21-inch porthole, a crucial component made of plexiglass. Bolts securely fasten the porthole around the front of the submersible, providing a breathtaking view of the underwater world. However, the revelations from the manufacturer's letter shed new light on this critical element. The manufacturer's letter discloses a limited certification for the porthole, specifying a maximum depth rating of only 1,300 meters. This certification falls far below the depths the Titan intended to reach during its ambitious explorations. 
This revelation raises significant questions about Stockton Resch's decision to rely on a porthole that does not possess the necessary certification for the intended depths. It highlights a potential disregard for the manufacturer's expertise and the limitations they had clearly communicated. The manufacturer's warning serves as a stark reminder of the risks associated with pushing the boundaries of exploration. It exposes a possible oversight in the submersible's design and raises concerns about the decision-making process behind its construction. The 21-inch porthole, once viewed as a captivating feature, now becomes a focal point of scrutiny. Its limited certification challenges the submersible's ability to withstand the immense pressures of the deep sea. A key figure in this unfolding story is David Lockridge, an ex-employee who turned whistleblower, shedding light on a series of critical concerns. His detailed accounts highlight the lack of non-destructive testing, which could have revealed hidden flaws within the carbon end products. These flaws, if left unaddressed, could compromise the structural integrity of the submersible. Furthermore, Lockridge raises alarm about the submersible's failure to meet the required pressure vessel standards, a critical aspect for deep-sea exploration. These pressing matters underline the potential risks associated with the submersible's construction. Shockingly, it is revealed that the manufacturer's certification for the viewport extends only to a depth of 1,300 meters, which is previously mentioned. A significant discrepancy from OceanGate's intended exploration depths of 4,000 meters. Lockridge's pleas for certification and addressing these critical problems fall on deaf ears. Instead, he faces dismissal and legal action, as the CEO disregards the warnings and chooses to protect the company's secrets at all costs. So why Stockton Rush chose to ignore these warnings and put the lives of the crew and the integrity of the submersible at risk? And the most importantly, what was Ocean Gate so desperate to hide? To gain a deeper understanding of the events that unfolded and the catastrophic consequences that followed, we embark on a journey that brings together a diverse group of individuals. Ocean Gate explorers, seasoned sea specialists, and even friends of the lost passengers, shedding light on the sequence of events and delving into the causes that led to these horrifying outcomes. To share their insights, emotions, and reflections, painting a vivid picture of the journey and the profound impact it had on their lives. Join us as we listen to their stories, allowing their voices to guide us through the twists and turns of this gripping tale. Steer the ship with a, a, a controller with a joystick from a gaming system you know a home gaming system there's special training just to learn how to get into an escape suit in and out of that it's it's a very tough thing to get into these kind of warm weather coveralls uh that will float you if you know you have to bail from a ship or escape from a submarine beyond that no real training when we went down it was just there were communication problems on every trip I've taken of the four separate dives I'd taken with Ocean Gate. Every time there was a problem with at least, you know, sporadically communicating with the surface. And again, I don't think that's their fault as much as just that's the nature of the beast. You know, when you're going a, a thousand feet or 13,000 feet underwater, you're going to lose contact for a while. Before we went, we had never seen the sub. We didn't know anything about it. There's very little information on the website. I didn't know at that point that the that you drive the thing with an Xbox game controller. I didn't know that the ballast was, you know, used construction pipes. Uh, and then you get the tour, and Stockton Rush, the designer of the sub, the CEO, explains to you that all of this stuff, the lights and the handles and the propellers, these are off-the-shelf parts because, well, not only are they inexpensive, but they're tried and true. They're mass-produced. The part we care about is the, the pressure vessel, the capsule where the people are. And that he designed with NASA and the University of Washington 
And uh, that, he says, is, is as locked down as it gets. His exact words were, everything else can fail, the lights can go out, the propellers can stop, but you will still be alive. You are bolted in from the outside. There are 18 bolts in a circle around the hatch. And by the way, they only fastened 17 of them. The 18th one is way up high, and they say there's really no mathematical difference. Um, so you're right, the really nightmarish scenario. Parts of the submarine that I'd seen in the testing in the Bahamas just seemed a bit shoddy. They're using industrial piping for ballast. They're using an Xbox controller for, for the steering. The strip lighting something you get at a DIY shop. Small cramped uh, services. I wasn't happy with some of the design, like the thrusters on the outside with the cables there. I thought that was a snagging hazard. But what really did it for me was they flatly refused to get any form of certification. And it seemed that they had no intention of getting any certification for going down to those depths once, let alone um, several times. They also had a lightning strike in during one of the testings, which blew all of the electronics. You know, these things happen, but they didn't have a bad, it ended the testing. And that made me ask, well, where's the redundancy? Because it's normal in a vessel of any form that has human life. You've got redundancy. You usually have two of two. So you'd have a, a redundant separate system and then you'd have two of those. But the fact that one lightning strike blew the whole thing was, bit, well, uh, where's the safety measures here? So just all of those things together made me think uh, there's a lot of risks here that I'm not able to mitigate and don't seem in control. So I, I pulled out at that point. That was the end of 2018. Let's be straight, it's not looking good. Oxygen's obviously very low. <clears throat> it's not just oxygen. The sub, let's assume it's at the bottom of the ocean. It could still be bobbing along at the surface, you know, just unable to communicate. But that's an issue in itself because here's another safety issue for me. It can only be opened from the outside. Uh, the decision was made not to uh, class the vehicle, not to get the vehicle certified. Uh, I ended my association uh, with, with OceanGate. Once Stockton had made the decision to use carbon fibre, he was never going to get certified. It's never going to be an approved material. Stockton threatened me with legal action if I if I went any further with, with my course of action. Well, OceanGate shouldn't have been doing what it was doing. I think that's pretty clear. I wish I had been more vocal about that, but I think I was unaware that they weren't certified. Uh, because I wasn't really studying it. I wasn't really interested. Stockton Rush asked me if I wanted to go out there and dive this season. You know, I wasn't interested. You know, paid half a million dollars to go down in this thing? Holy <laughs> You know, it's just, it's just tr tragic and it's horrific and it's unnecessary. And by the way, it's not lost on me as, as somebody who studied the, the meaning of Titanic. It's, it's greater meaning to us, you know, historically and societally that it's about warnings that were ignored. That ship's lying at the bottom of the ocean, not because of the nature of its steel or the nature of its compartments, but just because of bad seamanship. The captain was warned, there were icebergs ahead, it was a moonless night, and he plowed ahead for whatever reason. I think there was some greed, there was some glory in it. He had a, he had to boot up his rear from J. Bruce Ismay to get into New York on time or, or early so they'd have a headline, which I show in the, in the film, you know. And here we are again, and at the same place, you know. Now there's one wreck lying next to the other wreck for the same damn reason. And you certainly don't worry about implosion. There's never been an implosion of a vehicle with people in it. And so I think this... I don't want to say it blindsided the community because there was a lot of concern. And by the community, I mean people who operate subs and build subs for a living. There was a lot of concern about this outfit and this sub. A lot of concern, even to the extent that I wasn't involved in it because I was making Avatar 2 at the time. But a lot of them got together and wrote a letter to, uh, to OceanGate and said, you have to certify you cannot take people down. It's irresponsible. And it could lead to catastrophe. The revelations from these experts and friends of the crew members are truly staggering as they shed light on the harsh reality of Ocean Gate's CEO and the company as a whole. 
They expose a troubling pattern of rule-breaking, disregarding warnings, and even standing against those who dared to oppose their plans. Surprisingly, they proceeded with their dives without conducting a single survey. As our investigation reaches its conclusion, we receive the last piece of the puzzle, the wreckage. The debris from the ill-fated Titan submersible is carefully transported ashore by the United States Coast Guard, offering a fleeting yet revealing glimpse before undergoing thorough analysis. These debris images, although not providing definitive answers, offer tantalizing clues into the factors that may have contributed to the sub's fate. As we eagerly await the official investigation, let us delve into a path of exploration as we uncover the intriguing insights derived from this visual evidence. Examining the footage closely, an intriguing revelation emerges. The intact titanium rings within the carbon fiber hull hold immense significance. This suggests that the titanium components are unlikely to be the cause of the accident, while the more vulnerable carbon fiber parts may have suffered the brunt of the damage possibly fragmenting into smaller pieces. This aligns with our theory of cyclic fatigue, indicating that repeated trips may have induced stress on the carbon fiber, leading to cracks and eventual failure. Another captivating photo draws attention to the circular front viewport, which appears to be empty. Concerns about the suitability of the viewport had been raised even before the incident with allegations that it was not certified to withstand the depths required for exploring the titanic wreckage. This also aligns with the previously mentioned letter and the case involving David Lockridge. Whether the window failed first or if another component failed before the implosion, resulting in the window being blown out, remains unknown at this stage. Notably, significant fragments from the outer shell and the rear operating bay have survived the catastrophic implosion, prompting questions about their resilience. However, it is essential to clarify that these components reside outside the pressurized hull, thereby evading the inward compressive forces of the implosion. As mentioned in James Cameron's speech, while substantial fragments of the ship's external covering were recovered, the absence of significant sections of the carbon fiber hull is striking. This absence suggests a probable failure of the composite carbon fiber hull, potentially due to stress-induced cracks. Shedding the light to frequent testing, a process neglected by Rush. The tragedy underscores the importance of respecting depth limitations, as pushing the submersible beyond its rated capacity may have led to its demise. As we await the final investigation, only time will reveal the hidden truths and mysteries that still lie beneath the surface. However, will it align with what we have discovered thus far? Only the forthcoming days of the investigation will unveil the ultimate truth. The devastating consequences of these actions, however, cannot be overlooked, as they resulted in the tragic loss of the five courageous crew members. Yet, amidst our reflections, a haunting question arises. Was this driven solely by financial gain and profits? Or was it a reckless pursuit to outpace the competition and push the boundaries of advancement? Their untimely departure marks the heartbreaking end to an ambitious pursuit, a daring challenge into the future. What was once an extraordinary journey that began in the distant reaches of possibility has now been marred by the shattering of dreams. Even the bonds of friendship are strained as influential entities, Washington, Boeing, and even NASA disassociate themselves from the responsibilities associated with this perilous machine. The magnitude of the situation becomes apparent as the weight of their involvement is revealed leaving us grappling with the profound ramifications of such a dangerous path taken, and a sad story that have changed everything forever. Ladies and gentlemen, my friends and fellow explorers, we embarked on a long and captivating journey, filled with hidden facts, 
turning points, engineering challenges, and fatal consequences. Driven by the arrogance of a CEO, we are left questioning the motives behind it all. It's difficult to fathom what could warrant such actions in situations like these. But fear not, for our pursuit of the truth and understanding prevails, relentless investigation and the courage of those who came forward. We shed light on the darkest corners. As we navigate through the depths of this gripping tale, let us hope that lessons are learned and changes are made to ensure a brighter and safer future for all who dare to explore the mysteries of the deep.